Und jetzt freue ich mich. Hier auf der Bühne ein. And uh, now I'm looking forward to this. On uh, stage A in Leipzig at 35.3. One of the most uh, exciting artists in the world, Nico Semsrod. Hello. How's it going? It's a great honor to be the last thing here today. Many thanks for this invitation. I'm going to do a worst off today, of a worst off of my solo program. Happiness is just a lack of information, and I'm a demotivational trainer. I'm going to start with my favorite joke. It's also the joke that best represents Germany. It's a trick question. How often do we have the word love in our base law? In our, and it's in a word that has nothing to do with love at all. What does defeat mean? Defeat is my subject since I came to this world. I think that society is assimilating to my life. I thought it would happen differently. Defeat is wanting minus, is wishing minus ability. In order to be defeated, you have to want something. If you don't want anything, you can't be defeated. Worse than uh, defeat, or even more exciting than deceit, is not even trying. So I think you should always be very happy, very um, respectful towards everybody who has, who has suffered defeat because they tried something. I uh, published a calendar of defeat together with my brother Arne amongst others and I want to present you five of these defeats because to me and us it's important to talk about defeat more often to normalize defeat and uh, I will present you with five examples. The 21st of April, 1959, Gary Creeman starts his website match.com. His girlfriend meets another man there. That was in 95, I imagine. The 4th of June, 1923, during a horse racing, the jockey Frank Hayes dies from heart uh, from heart disease, but uh, reaches the finishing line the first time. It's his first victory. Uh, finishes, yeah, reaches the finishing line first. In 1976, Ronald Wayne sells his share of app in Apple for a few dollars. The 17th of July in the 1800s, in the USA, somebody, uh, a, a lawyer, tries to uh, restage a crime and shoots uh, himself. 14th of August 1977, the Australian Alan Jones win surprisingly wins the Formula One race in Austria. Nobody there knows how to play the Australian anthem. A trumpeteer start to play Happy Birthday. I was told that you don't like advertising, but this slide is already up, uh, is already in there. My online shop is kanzlerschenken.de. Oh yes, uh, introductions. But it's not, uh, it's not awful. Let's start by singing a song together. 
If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then do you want to show? Okay, it's a large uh, hall. All right. Uh, who of you has seen me live before? Just to give me a rough idea. I that must be at least 30 people. That's great. Who's seen me on TV or YouTube? Okay, who, who's never seen anything? It's going to be a rough hour for you. To present myself a bit more, and this is my very boring name, but at least the uh, the initials uh, follow the European trend. I'm uh, very happy that my parents didn't call me Simon. I'm born on the 11th of March 1986. This is two. This has two components the Chernobyl disaster and the date of the uh, Fukushima disaster. It's really uh, helpful for me to remember this. On the 18th, on my 18th birth birthday, uh, I witnessed, um, there were the uh, Madrid attacks um, on the 23rd, the uh, wind and school shooting, and I'm excited to see what else my life has to offer. I was born, uh, I was. I grew up in the suburbs. The suburbs combine the drawbacks of uh, the countryside and the city. And I was born, uh, grew up in a terraced house, which combines the drawbacks of uh, renting and owning high cost of living and uh, lack of privacy. That was when I was seven at the bird park. My satirical education uh, was received uh, at the <laughs> fittingly at a Catholic school. We had a book of prayers and every morning somebody had to recite a prayer. My favorite prayer was, Dear God, please make, please allow us all to remain healthy and stop the war in insert current area here. After school, I was confused like so many others. I didn't know if I should go right into unemployment or uh, uh, learn something, and I decided upon a compromise studying at university. Once there, I wasn't sure if I should con uh, continue or uh, stop, and I decided on compromise of uh, studying uh, econ uh, economics. That's not true, I just put it in there because it works. In fact, I um, dropped out of my sociolo sociology studies after six weeks. Uh, to concentrate on my depression, I could have well done that in uh, while studying because um, sociology is is uh, essentially that. But um, I thought I would become a uh, would stay true to myself and become a demotivational trainer, and I would give my life until now one of five stars. I'm good at doubting. I'm good at resigning, and I'm good at demotivating others. And then I wondered what I could. Um, do with these abilities and um, then uh, it came to me I could become head of the Social Democratic Party. But uh, then I thought um, I don't hate myself quite enough for that so let's uh, become demotivational trainer. Right. But I was considering <laughs> I was considering removing this gag from the presenta presentation because you're not supposed to joke about the deceased ones. One out of five stars, and this uh, is uh, zero out of five for erotics, zero out of five for action, and two or maybe three for undecidedness, I'm not quite sure. All in all, that's one out of five. And if I had to watch, if I had to comment on my life, I would say would not watch again. 
As a demotivational trainer, I have some great successes. For, for example, I'm an alcoholic. This, for, an, for example, is March 2014. The dates highlighted in red were when I had to drink, uh, when I drank, um, and the reasons. Uh, Munich. I could, I could. Munich was uh, was okay, sober as well, but uh, then it took a few days to recover. I landed some uh, viral hits on Facebook and YouTube. Got lots of feedback. I was uh, told I'm a whore of the system, being financed by the system. That's an absurd claim I can tell you who pays for my uh, pay, <laughs> pays for me that's 58% mum 40% dad and this won't surprise you 2% <laughs> of my gags are financed by the uh, uh, Syrian Association for uh, the demise of the German people I would like to popularize a way of thinking that I call positive negative thinking. It's positive thinking plus negative thinking, which uh, equals positive negative th thinking. Uh, positive thinking would be the glass is full, negative thinking would be the glass is empty. So, all in all, the glass is fully empty. In our society, we often, or at least in the neoliberal part of our society, we often assume that positive thinking is constructive. This has not shown to be true in my life. I think positive thinking is destructive, and you can see that in all large-scale projects in Germany. For example, if you, I, I personally, if I think that uh, this airport thing is going to work out brilliantly, then uh, you end up with a negative result. And if I, if I think about it negatively, I often end up with a positive result. So pessimists will often reach their goal sooner than optimists, because optimists don't imagine there to be problems and then uh, then get surprised by them, and uh, pessimists uh, already took those into account. Here's an example. The, neg the positive question is, what do I want? The negative question is, what don't I want? And if you, if you uh, think about life negatively, you, uh, your goal is to be unhappy, and uh, then uh, that's very easy to do, and reaching your goal makes you happy. But if I say I want to be happy, then uh, I will notice that there are lots of options, there are billions of options, and most likely if I choose one of the available options, I will wonder if I couldn't have chosen better. So I can't really reach my goal and I become unhappy. So that's the proof that a negative approach, approach will lead you to happiness is more likely to lead you to happiness than a positive approach. And that's the question I would use for all my life. What decisions can screw up my entire life? And uh, so I should look at life from the deathbed. Things you hear oft, uh, you rarely hear on a deathbed. <laughs> I wish I'd spent more time at the office or I wish I'd uh, listened to my uh, parents uh, when choosing my profession, or uh, did I did I turn off the stove when I uh, when I left? And before you lie on your deathbed, what happens then? This is a schematic drawing of the entire life. Uh, there's birth and death, and lots of emptiness in between. And because this is really hard to bear. People uh, fill that with uh, <laughs> with uh, silliness. We spend 
our life uh, in groups debating what silliness is right. And that's what humanity has always done. 10,000 years ago, people wondered why there is uh, lightning and thunder. And <laughs> somebody proposed a god of thunder and everybody was very relieved and said, yeah, we'll take that. And uh, 160 years ago, we uh, in uh, Europe thought that uh, bloodletting was a great idea for healing, uh, healing illnesses. So that... That makes it very unlikely that uh, somebody will one day think about us that right, they, they really got things right. So, if we're honest with ourselves for a while, there are only two things we can uh, we can believe in. Either all the, the bullshit that's already been rejected or all the bu bullshit that hasn't been rejected yet. And fundamentalists believe in uh, bullshit that's already re been rejected. And uh, people who believe in enlightenment believe in bullshit that hasn't been rejected yet. I would like to talk a bit more about f fundamentalist bullshit because that's been getting quite a lot of tailwind in uh, recent years. Now we're talking, and I will use the example of racism in the AFD, in the German right wing party. Because fundamentalists always simplify, we should not do that as people who uh, believe in enlightenment. Therefore, I would like to differentiate explicitly. There are not simply racist, they're not only racists in the AFD, there are also people who think racism is fine. Those in the blue part of this, uh, this chart are those who, um, who are open, uh, open-minded. How does it, how does this debate work that the racists think that we are not racist? while then the stupid people say, oh, good, very good, then is everything good. Of course, there is this principal problem that in the democracy that we talk about, there are other um, opinions, but now we're talking about about this tolerant paradox that this tolerance against the hip tolerance or about the Luxembourg freedom is always the freedom what everybody has think of, but what it actually is, what every, but other people think is, is that the thing that everyone is thinking is the same? Let's talk about it again. How does this battle of the races go? So first, every other people are less valuable as we are. And then the democratic people think like, please leave this um, activity. And then the racism sets, democraticers, why, we, why are you just for Nazis? That is... Somehow it doesn't work as it wanted to. I think this is a live hacking. Yeah. Um, no. I also talk um, another um, fully about um, explanation and fanatics. I actually couldn't understand them because from all of different um, of the praxis, like the explanators, they first talk about the facts and then make up a um, story. But while the fanatics, they actually first make up a make up a story and then try to find a fact according to it. Let's look up some of the examples and let me have a look how this. Every people is um, made out of different kind of personalities, for example, exa um, experiences, religions, political um, ideologies, physic, um, psychologic, um, health, social image. And then we come up with the fanaticers, people 
they're so, and they're just Muslims. And let's take this another example. Like, there is this phenomenon that there is an increasing social inequality happening, and then we can find out like what it, what it leads to. For example, they have in equal um, machines, low cost. Um, the salaries from others are lower, and there's also like immigrations and demography, and this finance crisis has just happened in 2008. And we find out from all of these reasons to come out like then the fanatic sets, okay, international people should go out. Because actually from the um, left to right, you can never come up to it. It's actually quite... Um, it's quite a fanta um, imaginary um, work. A third example is this phenomenon of that attempted to, um, for example, um, a lot of the races are under 53 years old, like that is currently not up to date anymore. Since summer 2017, it should be like an under 60, 46, 64. And I have to, I want to refuse to change this fully because I'm not ready to accept this bullshit fact. Maybe the most interesting thing is that 97% of the, uh, uh, the the mass murders uh, are committed by men, but I didn't say anything. So maybe let's be rational about it. So about the, uh, the insane people, maybe we could uh, try a human-friendly approach and improve the the care for these kind of people and maybe maybe we uh we take care of that or instead we could just uh prohibit bokas so maybe we just go back to the source so yeah there's there are some studies about this men who wear burkas have a, a very high potential for aggression. I found the debate about the, uh, the shooting in Munich very exciting because one racist with migrational background was shooting another one and basically the, the right-wing party in Germany said, yeah, we, we, we won't touch that, that doesn't make any sense. So, the the democratic uh, right wing party was saying, okay, let's just use the army and use them on our own soil. So let's look closer at this. And what it essentially means is, police is basically not capable to do it. So, I asked myself, what is it that the army can do that the police can't do? So the first thing I came up with was. Uh, we can bombard the inner cities. There were a few cities that got forgotten during the Second World War, so that's something the army can provide. Maybe we could just take care of that now. The chance that we hit the, the perpetrator in, the, in this case is also pretty high, so we should maybe try this in Dresden for, for a start. In the meantime, I'm not so sure anymore if the the army could actually do that. In the summer, I read that at any given time, only four of the over 100 Euro fighters are actually in working condition. So, at least in this case, I'm very happy to live in a country where most of the people actually just don't care. And then uh, I actually thought that if the AFD, so the right-wing party, actually ever gets into power, then they need at least another 10 years 
to actually get the army back in working order. So it's the first time I thought, thank you a lot, Miss von der Leyen, the German Minister of, um, of Defense. I think it's good that, that she actually takes hundreds of millions of euros and actually gives them to uh, consulting companies instead of buying material and ammunition for the, for the defense. I don't know if you know this, but a few weeks ago, both Macron and Merkel were actually uh, proposing the introduction of a European army. And I wrote on Twitter, I, I think this is a good idea, but please use German study. It needs to be, um, it needs to be very low in financing. It should never be able to take off. And somebody answered. I, I unfortunately forgot, but it was a great answer. <laughs> Imagine it is a war and no one can go there. This is a play on a German pun. Sorry about that. What, what other things can the army do that the uh, police can't do? So there, there's a humanitarian approach to just uh, flood the the inner cities and there's another thing we could just build schools next to a site of a of an uh, of an attack which is just a moment of confusion for the attackers no one would take care of that so then then i had another thought and i thought it was kind of weird and i realized that Horst Seehofer, a bavarian politician is still part of the government and sorry about that Okay, what is this? We give a face to crisis. Yeah, we give a face to the crisis. What can I talk about in a world where there's so much crisis, where Donald Trump is the president? What, what is it that I, as a, as a satirical person, as a comedian, can actually add to this? And two years ago, the party, which is the party, actually asked me to be become their, their candidate. So I thought, that's a great idea. So during the, the last federal election, I, uh, I was actually asked to be their, their nominee. And this, this is what ha showed up. A journalist was uh, asking me, which crisis? And I said, yeah, which crisis isn't there? In, in my opinion, there's no, no part of our society that isn't currently in a crisis. For example, all the major parties are in a crisis, especially a, a crisis of gaining new members. This is the average age of all the party members. So the, the Greens are actually one of the youngest members, and then it just goes up, up, to, a, up to an age of 64. <laughs> there's, there's literally... Um, dead people in their in their register i don't even know why we actually need a a specific sub organization of the party for the for the senior citizens someone's asking a question this also shows that uh, the party the satirical party is the future with an average age of 34 it's named in the same sentence as the AFD. That's because uh, both parties have roughly the same number of members. But um, AFD members die sooner. Another campaign poster. Non-voters vote for. I uh, wanted to uh, <laughs> to reach the largest uh, group of of voters in uh, Germany, the non-voters. I thought there was a gap in the market there. I um, I uh, had a campaign spot that was shown directly before the before the evening news, and. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, my appro approach approach was to convince people that it, if 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 they don't care who sits uh, in parliament, why not elect somebody who doesn't care either? Um, we see here in that, um, screenshot or this is a screenshot from uh, that uh, campaign video. I also considered <laughs> to uh, to uh, found uh, uh, <laughs> a stay in bed movement uh, in response to Sarah Wagenknecht's rise up movement, but uh, I couldn't uh, I couldn't bring myself to do it yet. But uh, this campaign video was the most shared campaign video ever in social media but uh, somebody commented that uh, that's uh, not surprising because it's also the one with the the most actual claims i am um, actually liked campaigning and i uh, wondered when i could do that do that the next time and i found out that uh, there's a european election on the 26th of may ne next year and i asked martin sonneborn who's already in the european parliament if i could uh, get the spotter uh, on the list uh, below him so uh, second uh, second place on the list and he sa he said he <laughs> all right there's uh, nothing decided yet i think a week before the election we sh uh, shall uh, start uh, campaigning and the idea is to uh, to um, have a European campaign on the uh, American model and this is a, a, a preliminary draft. I'm going to try the slogan, I'm going to, to trial it here, maybe if, it, if you like it, a possible slogan would be strengthen Europe, weaken Germany. My uh, personal approach is that I would like to become president of the Commission and if I become president of the Commission I will uh, <laughs> I would establish democracy in Europe against uh, against the will of the citizens if I have to. Let's talk about my next subject, drug politics. I don't know how you feel, but I uh, had to spend Christmas with my family and as always, I, um, I, I wondered why I had to do that sober and then I realized, oh, I don't. I can... Uh, I can, I can uh, use uh, incense, myrrh, and uh, alcohol to uh, to get drunk. Alcohol is, but alcohol is highly risky. So, why can't I be under the influence of a drug that makes me uh, relaxed? Or maybe that one that makes me fall in love with my family. The answer is obvious because it's because drug politics in Europe is being made by alcoholics. Let's do a little quiz. Quiz! And compare two drugs. Substance A is. Uh, uh, changes the state, state of consciousness has a hundred uh, 1.8 million uh, addicted people and is responsible for 74,000 deaths per year. Substance B is also also alters the state of consciousness has 300,000 people addicted and zero deaths per year. Yes, alcohol is um, the winner. It's legal, um, while cannabis is prohibited. And if you look at the last row of this chart you also understand why personally i don't understand it in protest 
of this irrational drug politics, I take drugs myself. Mainly illegal drugs, of course. But it would be more rational not to take any drugs at all, but uh, humans aren't rational. Humans uh, drive car while tired, <laughs> they play golf, and <laughs> they smell the finger that they just used to scratch their private parts. That's the level on which humans actually work. Humans have always taken drugs, even animals that have access to narcotics use them. There's a clear need to switch off the light up there for every now and then. The, the question of whether or not there should be um, drug dealing is a silly question. The clever question is who should um, who should run the sale of drugs. <laughs> Um, and it can either be criminals or the state, but uh, I have been told more than once that there might be an intersection there. Let's look at both questions. Who would profit from, uh, from legalizing all drugs? Firstly, the economy, the economy because uh, drug selling drugs creates, creates, uh, <laughs> creates jobs, and that should, actually, that should really win me the debate in Germany. But um, as an encore, I'm going to keep. I'm going to carry on. The legal system and politics would. Uh, the, the police would also benefit because they could um, spend their time on more important things. Consumers would also benefit because they would no longer get um, dodgy stuff, but actually stately, actually, um, dr but uh, real drugs control controlled by the state. The state would would also benefit from more taxes, more money, hooray. But who would profit from uh, carrying on as before? Uh, it's criminals. But those opposed to legalization say, I'm confused by change, we've never done that before, no, no, no. The year is 2018 and in uh, Germany... Um, and I mean the uh, and uh, the question uh, how how can how can we uh, obtain uh, how can we obtain money the the easy way to to money is um, is inheriting and uh, another way to uh, become rich is being born earlier had I bo been born thirty years earlier I would be much better off. And there are three arbitrary facts here. In 1987, people finished their studies at 28 in Western Germany, and in 2017, people finished at 24. This is a huge difference that's been that uh, was caused by the Bologna reforms. <laughs> Um, in uh, 1987, people had uh, protections against uh, being fired. <laughs> And uh, 30 years ago, the <laughs> the pensions were safe, and today, death, inheriting, death, inheriting, death, inheriting. It's uh, very close together in German. One of the big questions about the democracy is that the parents is going to determine what politics is going to happen and that the parties is going to decide what's going to happen and that 15% of the um, voters and then they are actually taking care of it and the current average life expectation in Germany is 81 years old and this comes from that they started from burning it and they are allowed to vote when, once they're 18 years old. Ja, 
Now, until 63 years old, you're allowed to vote and up And then once they're above 63, they're like to say like, hey, just be happy, you're still allowed to live. It's like anchor. And currently it comes like there's another older um, gentleman coming to me that that all of the ages are going to be discriminated, that they have this discriminated numbers, that this is not actually going to, like all of their years or the sage years are actually just sitting around and it had didn't say anything anymore. Um, yeah, well, it is somehow it's, it's about it's somehow fitting to the feeling. So I'm going to present present another text about marriage. My um. My friend, my girlfriend is like my vacational house, but I don't have vacational house. And marriage is about hi und raten in German, and that's why it's about hi and guessing. I found in the um, actually all of the. Weddings. If they could, if they could be loyal to each other for the next 50 years, and then they say, "Okay, five years is okay for me." I'm also okay for the stress that um, during the wedding. To be honest, during this wedding, there's actually no. I have the feeling that every month I'm being invited to weddings and I had to realize that most of my uh, my friends don't actually have cool parties but they're actually doing more like uh, state receptions and it, it seems that their aim is to add another facet to their own uh, search for perfection they're not marrying each other but they're actually marrying the other couples I'm, I'm giving an example from a wedding that I sat on in on the sidelines. They had an invitation that had its own le uh, logo, and then there was 18 hours in a uh, in a castle. There was a dress code: women with hats. If you, if you hadn't lost interest in, on, in the whole thing, you could still see the whole history of the couple on a home page. If the, if the presentation has to be this nice, then there's something that has to be wrong with the couple. They, they actually did a whole photo series on the website. I don't even know how they did it. I mean, maybe, maybe they just hired the, the photographer in advance and then actually started dating. They even had a photo of the, their first state where they got to know each other. H how is that supposed to have happened? One of the two actually had to have the plan in advance before even going to the first state just to take out the camera and then ask the other guy, uh, would it be okay if I take a photo now for our wedding homepage? The last photo in that series was from their engagement on the Valentine's Day in Venice. I, w I wouldn't even be able to get to grips with that kind of series if they actually keep going from their, as far, from their first fight, from their first uh, unfaithfulness, from their first divorce. Basically, it's a storyline that would be befitting of a, uh, of a daily soap where after half a year you don't even know who's together with whom anymore. I didn't just think that, I wrote that to them. Among comedians, we have a saying, you'd rather lose a good friend than a good 
Punchline. Well, they were only acquaintances, though. I'm, I'm starting to realize, anyway, that it's getting harder and harder for me to have an, an actual relationship with other people, to have a new friendship. I recently had a talk with another lady during a party. She, she told me that she was working at, a, at the German bank, and so the, the Deutsche Bank, and basically I told her, yeah, well, no use talking to you anymore. S several acquaintances of mine were basically stepping in and saying to her, yeah, he doesn't actually mean that. And I reaffirmed that, yeah, I do mean that. It, it kind of caused a bit of tension. I, I have a fine sense for that. Other people would have done a joke about that uh, in order to uh, basically make the situation a little easier. But I started crying just to make the situation even more tense. I'm actually, I have a very hard time dealing with uh, social things like um, other situations. I, I got a, a card introducing a new baby after birth. And do you know the situation where they give the, the child a really strange name? That is, that is really odd and you can't really tell them congratulations because it wouldn't be fitting. So I thought about it for half a year and told them, yeah, good luck. <laughs> well, with some topics, I know I'm, I'm basically on the wrong side of the story, but I, I can't help myself. I know I should be more tolerant, but I, I really can't. Recently, someone told me the 11th of March, that's uh, your, your zodiac sign is fishes, and I told him, shut up. So I, I, I added further that, yeah, fishes are really a very aggressive sign, you know. If against my best uh, interests, I actually take up on the offer to go to a wedding. And I'm, I'm usually very, very offended. And there's, um, there's, sorry. <coughs> Recently um, applied for private insolvency. It would be so nice if you could buy your way out of these, but uh, you have to actually collaborate because there's always somebody who has the tragic idea of making a funny uh, wedding video. Uh, or you may be employed as a as an editor for the uh, wedding newspapers. If I ever marry, I'm going to do it out of uh, revenge, and I will allow, <laughs> I will uh, make my my uh, invitees do everything. Here's um, here's the address of the local hardware store. You have one week. Do your best. Um, of course, I'm uh, on all of these dating websites. Um, but uh, nobody falls in love with me every uh, every 11th minute, once every 11 minutes. And what I find so incredible is that everything is um, contradictory. For example, uh, in private, I'm against slavery. <laughs> there's no there's no good way of finishing that sentence. But in private, I'm against slavery. But nearly everything I wear on my body on my body was um, produced under conditions uh, similar to slavery. But also, in my uh, my job is a contradiction. I can live uh, from my uh, criticism of capitalism. I can I I I earn a living with my criticism of capitalism. And I get invited more and more to company parties to uh, lighten the mood at the company. Um, all of these invitations are insulting to me, but I uh, did. I said yes by accident once. It was um, together with other people, and after. <laughs> uh, 
after, uh, afterwards somebody came up to me and told me your your talk was the best by far because nobody else managed to catch uh, the uh, the mood of the company as well as you did no matter where I look I am um, I end up in uh, dead ends <laughs> I recently downloaded a program for unzipping files but it was uh, inside a zip file who does that kind of thing you look younger on uh, older photos it's banal but it still gets to me Wikipedia says exper experts are people who know a lot um, on a certain subject but experts also tell me not to trust Wikipedia so I'm, I'm never sure what to believe in I'm, I'm, I'm completely confused and all of these are harmless examples compared to what's inside me my internal conflicts are really huge I often uh, <laughs> I often uh, I often uh, spend an entire debate uh, looking forward to the moment when I can uh, when I can go and wank off I mean on the one si side we're driven by our by our desires but we're also we're also capable of uh, intelligent thought but um, you always get uh, back to your to your deepest desire <laughs> and then you go for shit I like the reactions at this stage One part is the relief ones who say other people always, or <coughs> other people shit too, and group two are those who say no, I never go for shit. I like both reactions because they show that we in our neoliberal society of bullshit are embarrassed by our being okay. We um, shave off all the hair. We think it's disgusting when somebody farts, and you could take a more relaxed approach and. Uh, congratulate somebody on uh, being alive and even once you have decided to to keep optimizing yourself and becoming a machine because that's the uh, that's the goal of the neoliberal bullshit thingy it's uh, becoming a machine and making it's making ourselves more perfect but even in this optimization process, there are contradictions. It's um, People often say, be a good person and uh, have a career, but which of those should I do? Be yourself, lose weight. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, the message, that sums up the message of women's papers. Like uh, Brigitte, be yourself, Asterisk minus 20 kilos. Listen to your desires, but behave yourself. Within myself, I am. Um, I often. I never know if I should be myself or be a machine, and this conflict um, happens in everyday life as well. For example when my smartphone says um, I'm going to update, I say no thanks and um, it says it updates anyway or captures online where you are supposed to pick the tiles that contain uh, traffic lights or bridges you know what I, I'm talking about, I play that uh, for half an hour sometimes how many uh, how many uh, times do you have to play it to advance to the next level? Oh, 9,999 times. All right. Thank you. And I think this is... Uh, this is... Uh, this is so insulting. Why do I have to prove to the machine that I'm not a machine? I think this is one level below machines keeping us as pets it's what we do with dogs we let them do tricks and then they get a treat and 
and that's what the machine does with capture as, as well. Go look for the tile, find the tile, oh well done! Who's a good human? And then you get a you get a reward and uh, have to pay. Or um, when I take my uh, bottles to back to the supermarket to get my deposit back, and uh, I try to return my bottles, and the machine <laughs> tells me that I um, put it in the wrong way, I uh, lose it and think. Come on, you have an IQ, IQ of zero, but then again, who's the expert of bottles? And uh, at some point, I <laughs> call the call call an employee from the uh, supermarket to mediate uh, this conflict, and then uh, he puts it into the machine and tells me that I probably inserted it the wrong way. And I have no idea how I can how I can leave from that experience with my head held high. I sometimes drive a car to gigs, and I notice that cars don't really need you anymore either. They just watch you all the time, the entire time. <laughs> Recently, a, a car told me that uh, it had detected tiredness, so. <laughs> While still on the motorway, I uh, moved to the back bench and uh, to uh, have a nap, but the car didn't like that either and called me back to the driver's seat. So I opened uh, the windows and got an eco tip that had that informed me of increased air resistance and uh, to ask asked me to uh, close the windows. So um, I. Uh, but I refuse to accept an eco tip from a Volkswagen car. And uh, then I close the windows again. I uh, uh, often asked if uh, you would, if you wanted the funny end or the sad end. But <laughs> these days I uh, go for simply the end. I think the next talk is tomorrow at 10.30, so uh, we have a few hours. Um, yeah, but uh, I don't want us to run out of uh, memory or run out of internet. Because I've already thought about internal conflicts, I would like to uh, admit something at the end of this demotivational workshop. That's that I'm terrible in bed, and I don't think I no longer think of this as a bad thing, because being bad in bed means that you have had sex. I'm uh, sensitive uh, and sex in my in my, uh, in my life is uh, not self-evident it's more of a more an act of um, of uh, of encouragement but I would like to have a threesome, threesome because it would give me the opportunity to disappoint two, per, two people at once Every time I watch porn, I think that uh, that's not the way life really is. But that's the same thing I think in everyday life. For example, when I watch uh, advertising, when I'm on Instagram, when I get a wedding invitation, when I <coughs> read job offers. Job offers really make me wonder from which parallel universe they came. Live your passion selling screws or live the adventure of controlling. Good luck. But of course, we're, um, we're surrounded by um, 
by a fakery, and it's 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 uh, it's very natural. Living beings try to get advantages for themselves, but we live we we compete with with seven billion other humans on this planet, and of course that gives you an, a huge pressure to succeed. And I think to uh, lighten that pressure, we uh, need to learn to deal with defeat. And uh, <coughs> I would like a, a you porn of defeat where um, people, <laughs> where um, people don't climax. <laughs> that uh, sums up my last past uh, five sexual encounters quite nicely. There are more options. Turning off the other person so much that it has to uh, be uh, has to end. Falling asleep, having an argument that happened to me recently. Um, <laughs> I just stopped because I couldn't handle the pressure anymore. I also wondered if I could if I could end this workshop with a strange uh, gag like that about my defeat in bed and I thought yep because that's what interests me enlightenment and politics and uh, my defeat in bed why should I pretend at this stage it reminds me of a gig I it reminds me of a gig I did. It's there, there are just three minutes left and no more punchlines. It reminds me of a gig I did two years ago. I was in a psychiatric clinic as a, a birthday guest. It uh, That clinic turned 20 and I've rarely felt uh, so welcome. Before me I had a professor about uh, psych of psychiatry who thought we had a huge problem in society because we no longer live in a society of um, <laughs> sorry in this new uh society of success, the image is the all-important thing. In order to, to uh, appear successful, you have to show your strength, you have to hide your weaknesses, and you actually have to hide your, uh, your sicknesses, your diseases. And otherwise, you may lose your job, or at least run the risk of it. You just have to pretend. This pressure to succeed, this will have the very bitter effect in the end that people think that they're the only ones who are having a bad time and that everybody else is, is doing fine. I don't want to live in a society like this. This is one of the reasons why I'm talking about my own failures and problems on this stage. And at the end of this demotivational workshop, I want to uh, to uh, motivate you to do the same thing with your neighbor here in the audience and talk to him. This is how you failed. Respect for that. Thanks a lot for this. Bevor ihr jetzt alle rausrennt, bleibt noch mal ganz kurz sitzen, bitte. Denn ich hatte eigentlich etwas vor, am Anfang des Talks zu machen. Nico hat mich gebeten, es nicht am Anfang des Talks zu machen. Wir, also, dass er auf den Witz nicht gekommen ist, weiß ich auch nicht. Diese, diese Vorstellung hieß, Freude ist nur ein Mangel an Informationen. 
Und hier sitzen viereinhalbtausend Informationstechniker. Kein Wunder, dass die Hälfte von uns depressiv durch die Gegend rennt. Darf ich alle bitten, ich möchte einmal was gegen Depressionen tun. Und zwar gegen bei den Leuten, denen es wirklich schlecht geht. Viele davon sitzen unter uns. Darf ich alle die bitten, die Depression mal durchgemacht haben und sich von jemandem die Geschichte anhören würden, wo er gerade steht und ihm zu helfen, den ersten Schritt zu gehen, kurz aufzustehen und alle anderen sich einfach nur auffällig umzuschauen, dass diese Menschen die Chance haben, sich eine Person rauszusuchen und auf diesem Kongress anzusprechen. Also alle, die mal mit jemandem sprechen würden, alle, die mal durch Depressionen gegangen sind, alle, die ein offenes Ohr für euch haben, bitte aufstehen. Ich hoffe, ihr habt euch jemanden rausgesucht. Ich hoffe, ihr sprecht sie an, weil wir wollen euch nicht auch noch verlieren. Wir sind alle der Kongress, wir sind alle eine Community. Und jetzt zum Schluss bitte nochmal einen riesigen, trampelnden Applaus für Nico Sensrott! Ich kann das nicht.